Okay, so in this video, we're going to be looking at some questions on radioactivity, looking at sort of alpha, beta, gamma sources and some of the different uses of them. So the first thing we're going to look at is some equipment that ionizes air. And we use that ionized air to produce sparks. And the way that we do that is we have two sets of copper. Uh, one's just a wire. The other one is a gauze, so the radioactive particles can go straight through, even if it's alpha. And each of them is connected to a potential difference. So one is very positive and one is very negative. So the first thing you want to do, explain why sparks jump between the gauze and the wire when a radioactive isotope with high ionizing properties is brought near to the gauze. Okay, so the first thing to identify is that sparks are a current. Um, essentially, it's showing it's a flow of electrical energy between two locations. So that's what the sparks actually are. So to get a current, we need a potential difference, which we've already got. And we also need charge carriers that allow the, the actual current to flow. So the radioactive isotope is there to create the charge carriers, and it does that by causing ionization. So it creates free electrons and it leaves behind positive ions, both of which are charged and will move towards their respective um, plates. Okay, so that's what's going on. So an alpha emitting source, a beta emitting source, and a gamma emitting source, each of the same activity are tested. One source gives no sparks, the second gives only a few sparks, and the third many, many sparks per second. State the relative quantities of ionization produced by each type of emitter. So the fact that the source is the same activity tells us they're giving off the same number of radioactive particles per second. So the alpha source gives off, say, I don't know, 20 alpha uh, particles per second. The beta is giving off 20 and the gamma is giving off 20. But the thing to realize is alpha is the most ionizing type of radiation. And what that means is in a fixed distance, it will cause the most ionizations. And you see numbers quoted, it's considered to each alpha particle can ionize 20,000 atoms and all these kind of things. So alpha is highly ionizing. It will liberate a large number of electrons. And so you, that's where all your sparks are coming from. Whereas gamma will get very, we'll get no sparks at all. So one gamma photon can only ionize one atom. So which is why it's described as weakly ionizing because it doesn't really interact with matter that well. So it can only ionize very, very few atoms in a short distance and we don't get enough charge carriers to actually go about having a current. Okay, so we're just going to look at some of the basic properties of alpha, beta, gamma. So we've got the alpha, and we're just doing sort of relative mass and relative charge, we can see. So our beta, uh, this is usually the value that is quoted, uh, but anywhere around 1 over 1, uh, one over 2,000 is fine. Uh, gamma is has no mass. It's a photon. It's not a particle. It's something completely different. It's just energy. So a beta particle is just an electron. A gamma particle, you know, we've got, we could describe it as an electromagnetic wave, wave if we want to. <coughs> but we'd also describe it as a photon too, depending on what kind of model we're using. Uh, charge of beta is a minus one unit. Uh, and then gamma is neutral. So we've got a radioactive source contains an isotope of thorium. And thorium decays by alpha em emission, and it will be alpha because its proton number is greater than 82, which is kind of where we get the transition into alpha. So here is the decay equation for that, and the key is on the top lines, the nucleon number before and after is the same, and the proton number before and after is the same as well, they're 90 on both sides. So that's how we know it's correct. Okay, so radium is produced is also radioactive. And we've got a lab experiment to test for the presence of the radioactive emissions from the thorium source using a radiation detector. In the laboratory, there's a background count of 20 counts per minute. So we can see at position P, which is 1.5 centimeters from the source, we've got uh, quite a large count rate. But at Q, we also have a fairly decent count rate. 
and even though it's gone through five millimeters of aluminium. So, which radiation could be causing the counter Q? So, in my head, it's gamma radiation. So the reason it's not going to be beta is because both thorium and radium have a proton number greater than 82. So they're both going to be alpha emitters. So in theory, beta radiation could be making it through five millimeters of aluminium, at least some of it could be, but we're not producing any beta, so I think it's going to be gamma radiation. Alpha is certainly not going to get through the aluminium. Which radiations could be causing the count at P? So theoretically, 1.5 centimeters of air, we could have alpha, beta, or gamma. But I don't think it's going to be beta because, as I said, radium and thorium, their proton number is too big to be having any uh, beta radiation going on. Um, but at that distance from the source it's going to be mostly alpha because remember alpha is the most ionizing so most of them are going to be from alpha radiation okay so all three types of radioactive emission cause some ionization of gases what does we mean by ionization so with radioactivity when we say ionization we mean removing electrons from atoms leaving behind a positively charged ion but more generally, ionization can also be the addition of electrons too, and that sort of occurs in chemistry and all of those kind of things. So, suggest a reason why gamma radiation produces very little ionization. So, there's the few properties of the particle which cause that. So, it's very high speed, which gives it a very short time to interact, and it has no mass and charge, both of which mean the interaction forces are very, very small. And all of these factors add together to make ionization very improbable, which is why it can travel so far through a material before it causes an ionization and is lost. Okay, so next we're going to be used checking uh, welds to see how thick they are. So uh, we're told some information about the diameter of pipes and the pipe wall thickness, and we want to check how good a weld is. And we want to know if the weld is thinner than five millimeters of steel. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a liquid through that is, I'm going to use a gamma source. Uh, sometimes you'll see this done with uh, beta as well. Uh, you can do it with that too. So the, the liquid is going to be the emitter, and we're going to have the Geiger-Muller tube on the outside measuring the count rate outside the tube. So before I would even do this, I would want to know what the count rate is with five millimeters of steel, because that's you know the distance that we want. So we want to know the count rate that we get when we send gamma radiation through five millimeters of steel. That's our reference point. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a count rate in the actual pipe. Because if we get a higher count rate, that's going to mean our steel is thinner than five millimeters. That's the logic. Okay, so in order, so we're going to go through the process of identifying a decent radioactive emitter. So alpha's no good. If we did it with an alpha, meta, alpha emitter, we'd expect just to measure the background count rate if we had a Geiger counter. Beta. Probably we're going to get something similar to background as well. We might get higher than background because some beta particles might make it through the other side. So we can theoretically do this experiment with a beta emitter, uh, I think, because some of it is able to get through. But often this is actually done with a gamma emitter. So most of the gamma is going to get through the pipe, but there is going to be a decrease in count rate due to it being absorbed by the steel as well. So that's why I've picked gamma because the particles can make it through but the thickness of the steel is going to have an effect on the count rate that we would measure. So three precautions that should be taken to ensure the safety of the operator. Um, so having marked a few of these it's clear people haven't really thought about how this works. Remember we've got a liquid radioactive source so using things like tongs and all of those kind of things are out because you can't hold a liquid with tongs. So things we're going to need to think about. Um, if I'm an apparator, I'm going to want a device to monitor the dose that I'm receiving, first of all, so we can check it stays safe. I'm also going to, 
if I'm going to be using gamma, I don't want to be handling it myself. I want to be operating it remotely. And I want to be behind some very thick shielding, probably lead or concrete, something like that. The other thing is I don't want to be spending long using it. So I want to minimize the time in which I'm taking measurements. And all of these precautions are going to lead to a smaller dose of radiation. And a smaller dose is a safer dose. OK, so finishing off, looking at splitting the particles using a magnetic field. Uh, so it tells us the direction of the field is into the paper. So using Fleming's left hand rule, my finger is pointing into the plane of the page. Particles are traveling across to the right. So my thumb tells me a positive particle would go up the page, which means the negative particle is going to go down the page. So we're just using Fleming's left hand rule here. And that finishes off this video looking at this set of tasks.